What's up guys, it's Michael with MEB Adventures and today's adventure brings us to Moondrops Distillery in Fortville, Indiana. We are gonna do a tour and a tasting and we're just gonna check it out. This is a newer distillery. Uh, they broke ground on this in 2018 and we have been planning on going on a tour for a while and tasting, so we're gonna bring you along in this adventure. So we're gonna head on in. If you haven't already, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and follow us on all of our adventures. Let's go, guys. So here's the front door, and as you come in, they have all kinds of events. Here are the hours. It's hard to see, I'll post them. So here's a look at the lounge area. They got area for a live band. Lots of seating. Very cool, outdoor seating area, cornhole. Probably the Rick House back there. Merch options. You can come here and just buy bottles of alcohol also. And here is their bar. They have Taxman beers. So just like anything else in America, this place started with a boy and his dream. That's that's not true. It started with a guy, the <laughs> owner, that actually doesn't trust people. He doesn't like relying on other people. So he likes doing things for himself. The next story I'm going to tell you, um, it describes illegal activity, so it definitely didn't happen. It's all theoretical. Um, that's a disclaimer for you, too. Um, I'm also not going to use the owner's real name, so I'll go ahead and leave that out. So let's talk about the owner. The owner doesn't like relying on other people. So one day he decided, I wonder what it would be like to manufacture my own gasoline. And if you know anything about the gasoline making process, near the end of the process is a step where if you get it right, you have cheap gasoline. If you get it wrong, you have a neat pile of ashes right where your house just was. <laughs> He's got a really nice house and he didn't want to get rid of it. So he decided, all right, I'll just go ahead and keep buying my gasoline. But in the meantime, again, theoretically, none of this ever happened. He had discovered that he was producing methanol. If you don't know what methanol is, it's in your cups right now. It's corn liquor. It's, it's basically grain alcohol. All right. So he used to have these really big parties in, the, in his backyard. He would invite friends and family over having big bonfires. It's where the name of our bonfire, bonfire blends, Moonshine, comes from. And he would theoretically pass these theoretical products around. Jars would go back. They would go home with people, come back flavored that pissed them off. Not because it wasn't good, but because it was good and he had never thought. So he toyed with that for a little while. And then the next thing you know, he's walking down a beach in Florida when someone he had no recollection of ever meeting walked up to him and said, hey, aren't you so-and-so from Indiana? And, uh, and that's when he knew he had a problem. He either had to stop doing what he was doing or he had, the way to do it. he had to find a way to do it legally, which is how all of this was born. They broke ground on this facility in 2018. Certainly hope he doesn't see any of this video because I lie a plenty all the way through this. Um, if you wanted truth on a Sunday, there's a whole other building you can they broke out in 2018. Um, they, they started the actual distilling process in 2020, which is when they first made their first uh, drops of, of corn liquor. As I said in there, there's gonna be a lot that's going to be catered to just corn liquor and bourbon. Bourbon is just corn liquor that's been aged. We'll talk about that when we get out to the rest of the brick house. I'll talk a little bit about our vodka. I'm gonna discuss our rum a little bit because you guys are actually gonna be able to see it fermenting today, which is awesome. Doesn't usually happen. We make more corn liquor than anything else, and by Sunday morning, the fermentation is done, so you're just looking at a tank with some oatmeal mush looking kind of stuff on top. So, up here in the ceiling, we have a 30-foot functional cupola. You know what a cupola is? Cupola is sometimes uh, fancy people add these extra small house looking things on top of their actual houses. Uh, sometimes bells are in there for churches. Those are mostly decorational. This one's functional. It is vented, there's water up there, there's electricity up there. Eventually, there's going to be a 30 foot column still right here. Hmm. Why would you want a column still? Don't get ahead of me. 
we'll talk about that when we get over to the, the whole big model, which is our, uh, our actual stuff. So while we're waiting for that, let's talk about ingredients. Just like all of the equipment in this uh, facility, with the exception of one piece of equipment and one ingredient, everything is sourced right here in the United States. The reason the equipment is from the United States and most of it is within about an eight hour drive is because again, the owner doesn't like relying on other people. So if anything breaks down, he wants to be able to hook up his trailer to his truck, drive and go get it. Pretty smart guy, spent time, time in logistics. This place opened up right as the pandemic was ramping up and he knew even once that was done, there were going to be logistics issues. So he wanted to make sure that he wasn't caught with his pants down, at least in that regard. Behind you are the ingredients. Can we talk about bourbon for a minute? In order to make bourbon, you have to follow some rules. And more important than rules are actual law because bourbon is an American spirit, must be manufactured in the United States to be able to call it bourbon. In addition to that, in order to be called bourbon, it must be at least 51% corn. Anything less than that, it is not bourbon. Now that other 49% is usually taken up by one of two things, either wheat or rye. Most of your bourbons are gonna be wheat. If you're drinking a bottle of rye, it is a bourbon that is made with more rye than wheat. It's as simple as that. We get all of our corn from Fisher Farms here in Shelby County. Uh, the wheat and the rye also come from Indiana. And then the barley that we use to finish out the mash is actually comes from Wisconsin because they make a lot of uh, beer there. Do not swing the camera to where I'm about to point because it's the one thing you can't take a picture of. Right there is our recipe book. It doesn't look like a recipe book. It looks like a box with a screen on it. But we boop, 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 we plug, this, we plug in what we want to make and it tells us what ingredients to pull. Now, because all uh, bourbon and corn liquor or uh, moonshine is made with 51% corn, that's gonna be the biggest ingredient. That's why it's in this giant hopper. The rest we add to this little hopper and these machines know when to send which ingredient in. We have a two stage mill. The first thing we do with the corn is we crack it open because we're trying to get to the starch inside of it. After it goes through the first mill, it comes over here to Sasquatch, this is the second mill and it mills it into a fine powder. The reason we want it as a fine powder, if you know anything about chemistry, the finer your powder, the more surface area you have. The more surface area you have, the greater the chemical reaction, the more alcohol you'll get out of it. It passes through a sieve at the bottom of the Sasquatch. If it doesn't pass through that sieve, it sends it right back through the grinding process. Everyone with me so far? By the way, the one ingredient that we don't source here in the United States is right there in that tub. It's very, very dark. It's molasses. And that's because there are no molasses farms here in the United States. Our rum is a traditional Caribbean rum. Are there any rum fans here? Captain Morgan, Parrot Bay, 151, Admiral Nelson. You might not like our rum. Something that most people, most Americans that is don't understand about rums that are sold in America they're made to taste like a cocktail right out of the bottle. That is not a traditional rum. The reason most tropical drinks have a ton of fruit and sugar in them is because rum is a very challenging drink, the traditional rums. If you drink our rum straight, I happen to like it, my wife hates it. Now it's getting more and more popular. It's our lowest seller. We don't make a ton of money on it, but it's an authentic product and Mark loves making it. This is your final warning. If you take a picture inside of something and drop your phone, I hate it for you. Let's see if we can get everybody up here and make sure everybody can see what's going on. <laughs> so, Cooking. We crack that grain open down there. It starts to come up through this big hose here. All of that grain gets dumped into this mash tun. There's a giant paddle inside that mash tun and there's heating coils. We're creating this big hot slurry of starchy soup. Why do we want that starch? Because as you raise the temperature of starch, it gets con converted to sugar. That sugar is very, very important for the alcohol making process. Once that has boiled for a certain amount of time, we will pump it into these fermentation tanks. And then we do what the brewers called pitch yeast into it. Why do you want yeast in there? Yeast does two things for you. Yeast loves sugar, has to have it, eat it up like mad. They slurp it all up. When they eat the yeast, 
they or when they eat the sugar, they produce two things: CO2, which is venting into the atmosphere, which is mm. why it looks like they're boiling. Yeah, that CO2 being es escaping from the fermentation process. You can put your hand on the side of it; it'll be a little bit warm because it's an exothermic reaction, meaning it does create create a little bit of heat. heat. But there's no air hose at the bottom. There's no churn down there. You are seeing yeast burping up CO2. The other thing they're doing is they're peeing out alcohol. <laughs> That's right. When you drink and get drunk, you're drinking yeast pee. Live with that for the rest of your life. Now, when we, make our, <laughs> when we make our rum, it takes rum longer to ferment because the sugar and molasses is really hard to get to. It's not a very sweet product. So it takes longer to ferment. Whereas when we have our corn and our rye mash, which is what was fermented in this tank right here, that sugar is very readily available. The starch breaks down very, very quickly in the mash process. That um, fermentation only takes about 48 hours, which is why when they dump it into the vat on a Friday, by the time I come in for tours on Sunday morning, it's already done. Um, if it was fresh, and you can go online and look like Jack Daniels uh, has bunches of videos of their whiskey fermenting, it would look like a boiling pot of oatmeal. Mm -hmm. If you want, and I'm going to squeeze in front of you, I know it's going to ruin your camera shot. If you Take want, you can drag your finger through it. You can taste it if you'd like. Because all of the sugar is gone, it's going to taste mostly like vinegar at this point. But it's not going to hurt you. It'll taste, that is, that's a rye, and you can tell because there's rye right at the top. It's going to taste vinegary, but also very, very grainy. Um, and you won't hurt it. Yeah, you can pick it up. Just don't have a snowball fight with it. I had one I had one guy on a tour thought he would be funny and, like, pack one up and toss it to a friend, and it just falls apart. I was here for an hour after that, cleaning that up. Oh, man. He gave me a great tip, though. All right, so I discussed, I, I discussed the mash-making process. When we walk past, I want you to look down inside of there. You'll see the paddle wheel. You'll see the heated coils on the outside. The reason that you want to heat from the outside in gradually is because if you heat from the bottom, you're going to scorch whatever ingredients end up at the bottom and you don't want that, okay? Once you do that, take the right down the stairs. Again, please remember to grab the handrail. Can you say why the covers are on these ones? Because uh, they're not used. They've been cleaned and they're ready for a batch. Oh, okay. And that's just to keep stuff from falling in. Oh. Like falling turkey. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right, so we've got that nuclear soup in there, that big grainy mixture. What are we going to do with that? Well, we got to get it out of there. So we use this thing right here. This is a food grade transfer pump. We pump that mess through the case on this is our newest machine right here. And what it does is it, it uh, dries all of that grain that's in there, won't pass it along to the still and it gives us these edible puffs that we put on a pallet and we send off to a farm for cows to eat. And then every few weeks, uh, the farmer for that, for that, uh, for those cows or the rancher will bring the owner some steaks that he helped create. That's a true story. I've never seen a single one of those steaks. <laughs> so we pump it from there, through the caisson, into the still. Let's talk stills here for a minute. There are two kinds of stills and then there's this Frankenstein thing here. There is a pot still which looks like a pot, just about right here. And then there's a column still, which is a bigger version of what that column right there looks like. And then there's a combo still, which is what we have. Big Mama was originally destined for a distillery in New Orleans. When, when the owner of the facility uh, was looking to buy a still, he went down to the uh, a distillers conference in Louisville tried to get the attention of the big still making companies, Vendome being the biggest. The problem is for the size of this facility, most people starting up a facility this size will either buy an old still from a distillery that's no longer using one, or they'll just find a way to make it themselves. Well, he didn't want to do that. He wanted one ready made. Problem is he was too small. And after two days, there was a sales guy from Vendome, heard about what he was looking for, threw his arm around his shoulder, and literally said, let me help you with your little side project, which is pretty insulting because he had invested millions. The company that originally ordered this still um, was about to take delivery of it, and their building, again, was in New Orleans, and it had a bunch of Katrina damage. And right before they were going to take delivery of it, the building got condemned. 
that company spent every remaining penny they had trying to get that building up and running, and eventually went out of business. So this was available, and that's how Big Mom ended up here. So we pump that mash into here, and we start raising the temperature. If you raise the temperature on alcohol, alcohol boils before water does. So the very first vapor you get off of that, it is pure alcohol called white dog. It's moonshine. But it comes out at a very, very high proof. So high, in fact, that it's dangerous to even serve it to anybody. If you look around the building, there's one right there. There's these spray bottles that have handwritten on it heads. As it distills up, that mist comes over, it hits this chiller, which is why we have a chilling system, and it instantly turns that vapor back into liquid, which is pure methanol. It comes up through this sight glass. We have a test port right here that we can take port measurements out of. We use this, this is called a density meter. We use this to measure specific gravity of the white dog that's coming out of there. We cannot serve 190 to anyone. It's too dangerous. We capture it in this tank. This is called the heads tank. Those spray bottles that are all around the distillery are 190 proof, uh, or sorry, yeah, 190 proof grain alcohol that we use for sanitizing surfaces. We keep taking measurements, keep taking measurements. Once we get to about 150 proof, that's the hard to switch to this tank. That is the consumable moonshine. And then eventually through that boiling process, we will get to the point to where the specific gravity is so low, so high, the alcohol content will get so low, it's basically water, you're down to what's left, and we just capture it here. The hearts have, sorry, the heads have been drained out, it's now the tails tank. You go hearts, you go heads, then hearts, then tails. We just dump the tails. We check in there, we make sure it doesn't need to be clean, and what's left in here is the thing that dreams and restraining orders are made of. From here, you can do a bunch of different things with that corn liquor. You can put it in a barrel to start aging it for bourbon. You can sell it as moonshine. You can flavor it as our flavored bonfire blends. We have apple, we have peppermint, we have straight uh, white dog or, or uh, uh, Indian corn liquor. We have lemon shake up, which is our first, very first one and our newest one, which is orange dream school. They all vary between 20 to 25% alcohol. Any questions so far? All right, this is the fun part. I'm going to wheel this set of stairs in front of this. You get a chance to look down into Big Mama. Once you guys have done that, whatever uh, groupings of people you want. Right. because this is where I started my journey with All right. Bottling Welcome room. to the bottling room. It starts with, do you guys remember the, the tank of molasses I showed you out there? So when we bottle, we fill up one of those tanks with the spirits because we set it right here in this corner. That tank fills up this hopper right here. That hopper feeds these nozzles. You can count those nozzles. It is not made up. We can bottle four bottles at a time. We are not a big operation. The first thing we do is we take an empty bottle. We put it into this machine right here. This is called an air sparger. Put it in here. We hit a foot pedal and a blast of air forces silica and manufacturing dust out. We do not sanitize the bottles because we're putting alcohol in it. <laughs> put this in here, line them up four at a time, hit another button. This bar, which is normally up here, comes down and it fills those four bottles. If you mess up and you only put three, that's okay. These are spring actuated. It will not fill if there's not a bottle there. That's important to note because as we get lower and lower in that tank, we start reducing the number of bottles we're going to fill because we want to have as many full bottles as possible. However, we're never going to end on an even bottle. So when we fill up that last bottle, it could be to here, it could be here, it could be to here, but it's not a full bottle, we can't sell it. The federal government says we must destroy that and write it off. So I'm gonna tell you that's what we did. You get it? If you're employee of the day that day, you're the one that gets to write it off. 
Anyway, we move on to here. The capper's not here right now. It's tucked behind there. But there's a capping machine. It is capped one at a time by hand. You push it in with a little air trigger and a ram puts the, the cap in. This is usually laid up, loaded up with labels. We'll put this on, hit this pedal, it rolls it, puts the label on. We'll set it here. We take a shrink wrap neck, put it over the neck, put it right here, send it through. Yeah, that's the wrong bottom. This is a heat tunnel. It shrinks that and now you have a safety seal on your bottom. It's this table. This is called a gathering table. Any place that bottles anything has at least one gathering table. When this table fills up, because remember, there's only two of us in this room. When this table fills up, we both stop what we're doing, we come over here, we box up the bottles, set it through the table, send it on, set it on the skid. It is just by dumb luck that that door is 100 cases high. If you buy a skid of alcohol from us, it's gonna have 100 cases on it because that's what we can fit through that door. <laughs> now, if you spent any time in manufacturing before, you'll notice there's a huge flaw with this room. There's only one door that skids can fit through. So if you do not plan correctly, you don't have the right amount of alcohol, you don't have the right amount of bottles, which are usually sitting right there, and you run out and you don't have a full skid of alcohol left, you have to take that whole skid out, take everything else out, wheel in what you need, and then bring everything else back in. So, pl so planning goes into this. This will not be the bottling room forever that is not for public consumption. I just held to a room set. When we expand, one of the expansions will probably be another bottling area, okay? Heading to the Rick House. So the very first thing you're going to smell when you walk in here, just like any Rick house if you've ever been in one, is you're going to smell alcohol, and there's a reason for that. Let's talk about those bourbon rules again. In order to call it bourbon, you must age it. There is no requirement for how long you can age it. However, what you age it in, there is a requirement. You must take a brand new oak barrel that has never been used for anything else. You must flame the inside of it. We use a number four char, it goes all the way up to five, which they call gator back. We use a number four char. And then um, that barrel, once the alcohol comes out, once the bourbon comes out, you can never use it to age bourbon again. A lot of them go over to Scotland because a lot of scotch is aged in old bourbon barrels. It's gotten really popular to age beers in old bourbon barrels as well as port wines. So let's talk about why there is no climate control in this room. As that alcohol sits in this barrel, remember, it goes in corn liquor, looks clear as water. As the temperature rises in this building, this wood expands. When it expands, it sucks that, li that liquor into the wood. And then as the temperature in this building lowers, that wood constricts, and it takes that liquor that is in the wood staves, spits it back into the barrel. That's where your color and your flavor for bourbon comes from. It comes from the char on the inside of the barrel. Now, as that process happens year over year, sometimes some of that alcohol makes it to the surface and evaporates. They call that the angel share. Only 80, about 80% 80 of what goes into that barrel will ever come back out of it. The other about 5% is called the devil's cut. That stays in the wood and never comes out. It was called the devil's cut long before Jim Beam ever started selling a devil's cut whiskey. By the way, don't touch that crap. It's horrible. They have to actually <laughs> flavor it to make it palatable. It's supposed to stay in the wood for a reason. It's gross. The reason you smell alcohol when you walk into a Rick house is because of that angel share. Now, I'm going to tell you why I really respect Mark, and it's actually the, the reason I work there. It's the only reason I ever contacted him. At, uh, at the end of 2018, that sign got posted at the front of this uh, uh, um, property. It says, Future Home of Moon Jobs Distillery. And I was ecstatic. I am a huge fan of distilling culture in this country. I go to Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg all the time to tour the distilleries. I love going down the Bourbon Trail in Louisville. And it was nice to have something like that in my backyard. 
Not long after that building was built, I saw the first bottle of Moondrops bourbon on a shelf. And I got, I got nervous. I called bullshit because I know what the process is like. And there was absolutely no way they had had enough time to put bourbon on the shelf and be able to call it good. You have to age it. If you want it to be good, you have to age it at least a year. And it had not been that long. So I was pretty nervous. I picked up the bottle and rolled it around and looked at the back of it because I wanted to know if they were going to be honest about it. And it said, while we are waiting for our bourbon to age, we searched high and low for something that we thought you would enjoy. They are upfront about the fact that the bourbon that is on the shelf right now is theirs in name only. All they do is bottle it. And that really, really impressed me. That meant that integrity meant something to those folks. It's the only reason I ever reached out to them. Not that I'm an important person, but I wanted to say, hey, I noticed it's nice when you do the right thing and someone noticed, so that's why I reached out. The reason I bring that up is uh, the, the owner has made a commitment not to tap his first barrel for five to six years. He wants it to be a quality product. So he went out and he bought five years of bourbon that was already ready to bottle. All of this bourbon right here is ready to go and was manufactured by somebody else. Now, as we draw it down, this pile used to be a lot bigger. As we draw it down, we'll start tapping our own. We're about 18 to 24 months away. And I want, I want, to, I want to take a step back and look at this. There's over $2 million worth of bourbon sitting here. Maybe. It's all on spec. It could be garbage. You don't know. Now, they, they taste it. I'm going to show you that process here in a minute. They, taste sam they take samples. They taste it. They like the way it's going. However, it is a giant gamble. So in the meantime, we use our corn liquor, our, flavor, our flavored moonshines, we get those on the shelf, we have the tasting room, and, and we have y'all. If you had a great experience, I want you to go tell other people, because that's how we're going to grow. All right? Now, let's talk about the tasting process. Actually, let's come back to this. If you come this way and take a step back and look, you can actually tell where our oldest bourbon is and where our newest bourbon is. By the time you get down to there, those barrels look damn near new. <laughs> because we just put them there. And over here, you've got our weeping willows. You've got the ones that have actually started letting off the angel share. I can't tell you how excited I am about this. I was one of the first dozen employees, and I love distilling. So I'm pretty excited. All right, that product behind you. When this Rick House was built, the government tax man had to come and inspect it because up until then, everything was being stored inside uh, the tasting room. Matter of fact, when you go back to the tasting room, if you look down on the floor, there are stains on the floor from where we were aging these barrels. Pretty cool. Government tax man is walking through and he said, Mark, looks good. You got a problem though. You have manufactured spirits stored in the same room as purchased spirits. That is illegal. They cannot be in the same room. You have to put them in a different room. And Mark said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. You have to understand, I'm drawing this material down. I'm never gonna need that area for, any, for purchase spirits again. He said, I don't care, you're breaking the law. And he was like, you want me to build a wall bisecting the building I just built for temporary purposes. And he said, well, that's where the good news is. For purposes of fulfilling the law, tape on the floor is just as good as a wall. That's your government dollars at work right there. For everybody that invite that I invited back here to step and take a look back, you are fucking musician magicians. You just walked right through a wall. Bam. All right. This next part I include just because That's funny. it saves me some time inside. We have five bourbons right now. Six if you count one of the promotional things, but I'll cover that inside. We have our, our uh, black label. I don't want to call it our basic bourbon, but it's the entry bourbon. None of my, our bourbons I would ever suggest as mixers because they're very, very good. The next step up is our single barrel. Our master distiller and the owner goes through these barrels. They use this equipment right here, and I'll show you how we use it in just a second. If they come across a barrel that is unique in flavor, and they think that other people will like it, they will pull that one aside, and they will bottle, they'll proof it down to 100 proof, which is what all, most of our bourbons are at. And they'll sell that as a single barrel batch because it's different than the rest. Mm -hmm. Every now and then they'll come across one that not only is it delicious or unique in some special way, it's not overly harsh. So they won't proof it down at all. They'll bottle it straight out of the barrel and they'll call that 
barrel proof. We have some of that as well. We just did a run of barrel proof. It's expensive. If you're a bourbon drinker, it is worth every penny. All right. And then we have another one. We only have about a case and a half left. It is only available here. It is a double oak. It has been aged four to five years, I believe. And then they take it out and put it in a brand new oak barrel and age it again. And it's a rye to start with. It is a very tasty bourbon. It's one of my favorites. And we're starting to run low. In addition to that, we have the moonshine flavors that I already told you about. And we have a vodka, which is dangerous. And when I say dangerous, warm, it has almost no taste or burn to it. Chill, it tastes like water. So be very careful with it. And then we have our rum, which I can start. All right, let's talk about how we sample barrels. I'm gonna use some funny words. Let's keep the, the giggling to a minimum. Every barrel has two holes in it. Okay, we're doing all right. They are called bung holes. They're called bung holes because this wood stopper, which is called a bung, keeps that hole sealed. In order to sample the deliciousness inside, we take this hammer drill, and it's, it's called a hammer drill. We start screwing, we get it started. Once it's got a nice, good, tight hold on that bung, we start hammering it out, and we rip it out of that bung hole. Now we can access the thing inside. We take this copper tube, this is called a siphon. The pointy thing has a hole on that end and a hole on that end. We take this pointy thing, we slip it inside of the bung hole. But I heard a good one. You're trying. You're I'm trying. trying. Really yeah. I'm working the hell out of it. <laughs> You guys have a rough crowd. You put your finger over that hole, and if you've ever played with your drink at McDonald's, you know that all of the liquid that's caught in this siphon, or that's in the siphon, is going to stay there. You pull it out, you pour it into a Glen Cairn glass, and you taste it. They do that, they take notes, they find one of those special ones, they'll wheel that one to the side, get a piece of chalk, write on it, don't touch. And then you take your bung hammer, you take your bung if it's still in good shape, this is a new one, and you drive it back into the bung hole, and then you put it away. Boy, if you guys aren't gonna laugh at that, you're not gonna laugh at the next one. All right, I ask you to do two things for me. Tell everybody that you know if you had fun. Uh, if you didn't, tell nobody. Um, second thing is uh, Google review, Yelp, whatever the other one is now, TripAdvisor. If you had a good time, five stars. If you didn't, if it's anything less than five stars, I ain't mad at you. Leave your review, but tell me why because I want it to be five stars for the next group, okay? Any last questions? Because I'm sweating like a stuck pig. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hang up these tools. You guys can take a couple seconds, and if you want to, you can walk. You cannot go any further than this last shrink wrap skid right there. All okay. right? I'm gonna hang these tools. The question that didn't come up So you can definitely tell the aged barrels. Uh, and as you move down the rack, the newer barrels that have not seeped into yeah, yet. So, uh, usually when people hear that we are not allowed to use the barrels again for uh, urban aging, everyone assumes, oh, so there's this huge marketplace of technology barrels that are available. The thing is, because of selling them to... Smells good in here. Wonderful. This is a 175, typically what, it, what you would call a handle. We just don't have a handle on ours. This is the rum I described. Again, I would suggest one of you get a pour of it. All of you smell it. Uh, this is more the vodka. This is apple pie. That is 25% uh, alcohol, so it's 50 proof. This was our first one, the lemon shakeup. It is 20% uh, alcohol, so 40 proof. It will freeze, so if you throw it in the freezer for 90 minutes, take it out, shake it up. It's a slushy now, throw a straw on it, wander around your neighborhood, go garage sailing. This is our newest one, <laughs> Orange Dreamsicle. We just got some more, which is good. Um, it's been kind of hard to, it, it was a lot more popular than we anticipated, woohoo, which is great, but it's getting harder and harder to find. This is our peppermint, very, very delicious. Tastes like a peppermint star candy. Not overly sweet, not real syrupy. One of my favorites. This one here is the moonshine flavored moonshine that is Indiana sweet corn liquor. It's the base for all of our bonfire blends. Black Label, this is our entry vodka. We proof it down to 100 proof. It is absolutely delicious. 
This one right here is our single barrel. That's also proof down to 50% uh, alcohol. This one here is our barrel proof, which we just got more, we just didn't bottle more of. That's the one that's gonna be higher alcohol content because it's a really special barrel. This one right here, we have very, very little left. This is our double oak. It's been aged once, removed, and then aged again, and it is a rye, so it is very, very spicy. And when I say spicy, I don't mean hot. I mean, it's got tons of flavor in it. One of my favorite bourbons of all time. And then there at the end, we don't have much of that left either. It's our Lights Out Bourbon. It's a collaboration we did with Chris Lytle. He's an MMA fighter. It is, in my opinion, it's, it's not up to par with these. It's the only one on our roster that I would use in a mixed drink. All right? Um, if you see things floating in our moonshine, that's because we use fruit. Don't get scared. And that's it. Rachel's going to take over. I hope you guys have a great time. Um, and if you have any questions, she'll help you because, boy, I'd like to buy that double So they have all kinds of merch. Here's the Dream Sickle Shake Up. And then they have Arctic Zone Cups, which are really good if you put the, uh, put the freezies in them. They have coffee. Oh, this is cool. Cup holder out of an old bourbon barrel. Make a nice bedside cup holder. Rum and corn whiskey. Nice. Alright guys, I'm going to try the rum and the double oak. I'm going to go over here. Also, they have water here if you need some water. Alright guys, we're going to try the rum and the double oak. A double oak does have a lot of flavor. Really good. Definitely got that spice to it, too. I like it, though. That's a good double oak. So that was the double oak. It's, that's really good. Here's the rum. Smells good. It's pretty smooth. Really smooth, actually. Thanks for joining us on this Moondrops Distillery Tour and Tasting. We had a lot of fun, and as always, please like and subscribe for more videos like this. Until our next adventure, take care.